Welcome everyone to today's MDA Engage Pediatric Seminar. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, my name is Nicole Petrowski and I am the Community Education Specialist here at MDA. I wanted to um, let everyone take a look at the agenda that we have today. We have a pretty busy day, as you can see. We are going to start with Dr. Katherine Matthews here in just a little bit. Um, but I do have just a few housekeeping items before we begin our seminar so everyone is aware. We are recording today's uh, event and we will be posting it to the mda.org website for on-demand viewing in a few weeks. And for those of you who are joining the event live, we do have all phone lines muted. We will be having a Q&A session at the end of each presentation. So if you hover over either the top or the bottom of your screen, you will see some webinar icons. If you utilize the Q&A icon to type in your questions, you can submit those whenever you have them. You could submit them to host uh, when that is necessary. And then also you can feel free to use the chat feature. You can also see that on your icons. Um, you can use that during the seminar. If you have any comments, just make sure you click on all panelists and attendees when you type in the comment. If you just type on all panelists, I will be, I'll be the only one that can see that. And then you'll notice on the agenda, there are a few small breaks between some speakers, five, 10 minutes here and there. So feel free, you can just stay connected to the live broadcast during those times. But we will also have, um, that will also give you time to get something to eat or grab you know, some water. And that is also the time where I will be checking the next speaker's audio and video. So you will hear me speaking, um, so I am aware of that. And then finally, we will be sending out a brief survey afterwards, and we would like to receive your feedback on what you heard today. We wanna to make sure we are discussing, discussing topics that are of interest and that are relevant to our community, and so we use your feedback as a way to improve future educational events. So thank you in advance for taking that uh, five to 10 minutes to complete that survey. And also, just so you know, we are giving away two $20 Amazon e-gift cards for those of you who do submit um, at the end of the seminar, we're going to be drawing two emails out of that group. So that's a little enticement for you guys to do that. Now, I would like to start off the seminar with just some information about MDA and to give you a quick background on what it is we are and what we do. We are committed to community education and believe in bringing our community together for opportunities to learn from specialists and have opportunities to connect with others. This event is part of a larger MDA Engage series with disease specific symposia, community education seminars such as this, and also our Engage community webinar series, which are hour long series. We are committed to transforming the lives of people affected by muscular dystrophy, ALS, and related neuromuscular diseases. We are able to honor this commitment by our work in two areas, through innovation and care via our 150 plus care centers, resource as a, resources, our education and recreational programs, and then also our innovations in science with focus on research, therapies, and technology. And we have been doing this for over 70 years. We are an umbrella organization, so we do support over 43 diseases in the neuromuscular disease space. No other nonprofit supports so many neuromuscular diseases. And as an umbrella organization, we have the benefit of leveraging key learnings from one disease to inform others. And to learn more about the 43 plus diseases under our umbrella, please visit mda.org and you could go under the About Neuromuscular Disease heading. Next, the innovations in science section, and this is where MDA has made significant investments in advancing the treatments for neuromuscular disease. We are the largest source of funding for neuromuscular disease research outside the federal government, 1.4 billion since our inception. MDA's research is directly linked to approved life-changing therapies across multiple neuromuscular diseases. We developed a first and only data hub to aggregate healthcare, genetic, and patient reported data and help accelerate future breakthroughs. On this slide, you can see the progress that has happened in drug discovery over the past five years in the neuromuscular space. Treatments are now available for periodic paralysis, DMD, SMA, ALS, myasthenia gravis, and LEMS. And we are proud to have provided funding to many of these treatments along the development process. 
our MDA Mover Data Hub, which stands for Neuromuscular Observational Research, is improving the ability of researchers and healthcare providers to enhance the care and management of individuals living with neuromuscular disease. This is done by driving disease understanding, accelerating therapeutic development, and optimizing health outcomes. Mover collects clinical and genetic data from multiple uh, neuromuscular diseases to improve health outcomes and accelerate drug development. We are working this year to include patient reported data in Mover. Currently, seven MDA diseases are in our database, ALS, SMA, Duchenne, Becker, FSH, Limb Girdle, and Pompeii. To expand this number, we are going to be increasing the diseases that we cover in the coming years. So that is something that we are actively working on. And we are also actively working on getting Mover implemented in as many care centers as possible. Mover only succeeds if we have the client population, like those of you in the audience who take part. If the Mover registry is available at your care center and you have one of the seven covered diseases just mentioned, please consider joining the registry and talk to your care center director. Now let's take a look at MDA's innovations in care, and we will start with our care center network. We have the largest network of care centers for neuromuscular disease, providing best-in-class comprehensive care, and some of our speakers that we have today are those care center directors. Our care centers ensure multidisciplinary approach for patient care, which provides patients the opportunity to see multiple clinicians in one visit and allowing for comprehensive coordinated care that help reduce the number of trips required to take to the doctor. And you don't have to navigate your disease journey alone, we're here to help. Our MDA Resource Center is available to provide one-on-one -on -one support via phone or email for individuals and families looking for information about the disease covered under our umbrella. Our Resource Center is staffed by caring professionals and offer a unique perspective and support the MDA community. It provides information on the Care Center Network, uh, some disease information, community resources. Uh, it also talks about our Engage series, such as we're having today. And then you can look at your screen. We cover several other things as well. Our resource staff is available Monday through Friday from 9 to 5 Central Time and typically are able to answer all your questions within one to two business days. This is another great tool that's available at your fingertips. Um, and this comes up a lot in our, in our talks you know, where can we find a clinical trial? So this tool provides a comprehensive list of currently enrolling clinical trials in the neuromuscular disease space. The tool will walk you through some simple questions to direct you to the appropriate trials that meet your criteria when you share that. And you can look at this tool on mda.org slash clinical trials. We have a myriad of patient and caregiver resources which are available on mda.org and through contacting the Resource Center. They include the Quest Magazine, which is mailed to your home quarterly, multiple print and online resources such as the Caregiver's Guide, Teacher's Guide, and also disease-specific information. And you can sure to be uh, connected to our MDA blog, which is called Strongly, if any of you guys like to read about blogs. One thing MDA is dedicated to is advocating for national policies and programs that accelerate the develop development of therapies and cures, facilitating early diagnosis and treatment from day one, and ensuring access to the COVID-19 vaccine and ensuring access to critical support. And we also want to make sure that we are promoting independence. Together with advocates and families and volunteers and partners, we ensure that the collective voice of our community is heard. Some of the current advocacy initiatives include accessible air travel, newborn screening, access to genetic testing, patient-focused drug development meetings, and increased federal funding for research. We need you to join our advocacy network. It helps uh, the more families that we have involved. Thank you to those who have, who have already joined us as MDA grassroots advocates. And for those of you who have not, please consider signing up today at mda.org slash advocacy or texting, as you see on the screen, 50457 to MDA USA. Becoming a grassroots advocate means you will be informed on various ways you can join us in advocating for policies and initiatives that support the uh, neuromuscular disease community. You will receive advocacy alerts, which lets you contact your representatives directly and share your stance on issues. And you will be invited to take part in various advocacy issues and, and events. Sorry. 
So we do have multiple ways to become involved with us from attending one of our educational events to share our social media posts to volunteering virtually and when it's safe to do so in person. So the two areas to highlight on becoming involved with NDA and join our organization by actively participating in one of our fundraising efforts. So we encourage those of you who are interested in our mission, whether you have a diagnosis that falls under our umbrella or are a parent, a guardian, or a loved one of someone who does, please join us. You will become part of a community of families, researchers, physicians, and advocates who are all helping children and adults live longer and grow stronger. You will also stay up to date on the latest information and education to help keep your family informed in the neuromuscular community. You can visit mda.org join and sign up. It'll take about five minutes for you to complete those steps. You will ask, be asked a couple questions about you or your loved one's um, diagnosis and your contact information. And we have multiple opportunities to become active in fundraising efforts. Our muscle walk, which many of you have participated in when we were able to do those in person, it will be one day virtual, or it will be one day live again, but for right now, our virtual event is on August 7th. And throughout the day, we will be celebrating with our national ambassadors, hosting virtual pep rallies, events, and fellow participants. We'll have breakout sessions. For more information, you can go to mda.org slash musclewalk. And we are hosting a movement month in May, where a focus on activity and fundraising will take place. There will be chances to join live class with the MDA community. Kickoff for that is May 1st, and we will join each other virtually on May 22nd to celebrate what accomplishments were done that day. And lastly, with Team Momentum, every mile you run, walk, cycle, or move, and every dollar you raise will help fund the important work we are doing. For more information on Team Momentum, visit mdateam.org. That's mdateam.org. And so that is just a little bit of an overview of what we are about here at MDA. And if you aren't part of our organization, I hope that um, you definitely will consider joining us. And we would look forward to that. So thank you. With that, I would like to introduce our next speaker. We are going to hear from Dr. Katherine Matthews, who is a professor of pediatrics and neurology and the vice chair of clinical investigation for the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. She completed all of her postgraduate graduate training at the University of Iowa, including pediatrics and child neurology residencies, followed by a fellowship in medical genetics. She was involved in the early efforts to map the gene for SSHD, and current research activities are focused on clinical aspects of muscular dystrophies with the goal of improving outcomes. She directs the clinical project at the University of Iowa's Wellstone um, Muscular Dystrophy Cooperative Research Center and is involved in multiple industry-sponsored clinical trials of potential therapies for neuromuscular diseases. Dr. Matthews runs an active clinical service and has been the director or the co-director of the University of Iowa's MDA clinic for over 20 years. So thank you for being here, Dr. Matthews. It is my pleasure to join you this Saturday morning in the midst of a pandemic and uh, record-breaking horrible weather. So I hope everybody is warm and has water and food. What I'm gonna be talking about today is multidisciplinary care in pediatric neuromuscular disease. And let's see, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble making my slides move. There we go. I'm sorry, having technical problems this morning. So first of all, uh, disclosures. I have no pertinent um, disclosures um, regarding today's talk although I do get funding from a number of different both organizations and um, industry sponsors. So what I'm going to talk about today is what is multidisciplinary care and why is it important? Um, what does multidisciplinary care look like in the um, clinic? I'm going to give you some potential models and give you our example. And then, because I knew I couldn't talk for 45 minutes on multidisciplinary care, um, Nicole asked me to um, make a few brief comments on COVID-19 and pediatric neuromuscular disease, since that is a topic that everybody is very interested in. So I looked up definitions. I mean, I kind of knew what multidisciplinary care was, but um, I looked up, 
I hadn't really thought about defining it. So I liked this definition. Multidisciplinary care is when professionals from a range of disciplines work together to deliver comprehensive care that addresses as many of the patient's needs as possible. And I like a couple things about that. It emphasizes the as possible. It's professionals from a group of different um, specialties and areas of expertise um, to try to do the best thing that we can for the patient. So why is this important for pediatric neuromuscular disease? And I suspect that I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, I think most of you on the audience um, live with this, and so you are familiar with why this is important, but um, patients and families have enough on their plates. Um, you are navigating a lot of different things and anything that we can do to help minimize that um, need to navigate is beneficial. And then optimal care of pediatric neuromuscular disease and adult neuromuscular disease is quite complex and no single person can do it or know it all. So we really need to take advantage of the expertise of our colleagues. Just as an example, a couple of examples here to um, emphasize the complexity of care, this is just the um, overview of the, the sections identified in the Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy Care Guideline that was published in 2018. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to read them all because I've got several slides that look similar, but um, so these were the topics that had been um, included in the 2010 guidelines and then they added five more um, topics in the 2018 guidelines. So um, you can see that, you know, no single um, person knows all of these different areas of specialty. And then there are similar, um, a similar list is from the 2018 SMA management guidelines. Um, very similar, they've sliced and diced a little differently, but again, multidisciplinary care is required. So from the MDA website, um, these are the potential um, members of an MDA care center to try to meet all these um, needs of these complex diseases. Um, cardiologists, nutritionists, genetic counselors, neurologists, nurses, orthopedists, physiatrists, physical therapists, and occupational therapists, primary care physicians are certainly an important partner, although they're not um, usually sitting in our clinic, psychiatry, psychology, pulmonologists, respiratory therapists, social workers, and speech and language pathologists. So, um, what I'm going to emphasize, I think, is that you will not see all these people every day, every time you go to the clinic. Um, but these are all people who may um, be involved in a child's care. So how does this all fit together? So I liked this quote from the SMA guidelines, um, and it is written about SMA, but applies to all of the diseases that we care for. So it says SMA is a complex disorder involving different aspects of care. In the past, families had to coordinate all the assessments and visits, but it's now recommended that they should be coordinated by one of the physicians typically a neurologist or pediatric neurologist in SMA who's aware of the disease course and potential um, issues. So the way I put this together is the, in general, the primary neuromuscular doctor has the greatest knowledge of the breadth of the diseases. So they um, are the one who knows the, the range of complications, the kinds of people who should be probably involved. And then they work together with the patient and family to um, assure that um, the appropriate other specialties are involved in care at each stage of the, stage of the disease. And the neuromuscular physician recognizes and defers to the expertise of each team member because, as I said, we cannot know everything. Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the fact that the MDA clinic one size does not fit all and your experience in your MDA clinic may be different than what you see online from somebody else's and there are lots and lots of reasons for this. Um, every institution, state, and region is unique. Um, patient populations vary. There are what I call boutique clinics where most of their patients fly in from other areas of the country. 
that's a very different setting than a clinic where um, many of the patients have more limited resources. And the, the, hopefully the provision of care will be this as good in both of those, but the clinics are going to look different. Another example is rural versus urban. The, um, you know, if everybody lives within uh, mass transit of the hospital, you may be able to provide all of your care in one setting. Whereas if people live six or seven hours away, you have to be a little bit more creative about how you operate your, your um, program. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. State and institutional resources vary. So similarly to where I talked about boutique clinics versus clinics that have less um, resources, going to a state university clinic is going to be potentially different than going to one that has extensive private funding. Um, you have to, multidisciplinary clinics are expensive. So, you know, if you have a bunch of specialists and I, by specialists, I mean, I'm including physical therapists and social workers, a bunch of healthcare professionals who are um, sitting in a clinic and may not always be seeing patients at the same time, that is less efficient than if they were in their own clinic and they were scheduled every half an hour to see a patient. So there are, there are expenses involved in multidisciplinary clinics that make them more complicated to run. Um, the MDA support, while it no longer goes directly to um, patients, is helpful in offsetting some of the costs of having, for example, a social worker available in the clinic or having a physical therapist sitting in the clinic where they may not see a, a patient every 30 minutes or every hour like they would in their own, um, their own practice. Um, so the resources vary, the MDA support helps offset some of those re resource um, demands, but, um, but that's another reason that your clinic may look a little different than somebody else's clinic. Um, I guess another um, way that expense is that is huge is something like a cardiologist. Cardiologists are very expensive doctors and um, so sometimes they will sit in a clinic and see, you know, five of the 10 patients scheduled that day, but sometimes they will not be able to be able to just be sitting in your clinic. Um, and then another way that um, clinics differ is that the personnel roles may differ. So the, the, the best example, I think, is the who runs, who serves as a clinic coordinator. So in some place cases, it may be a nurse, um, a um, nursing assistant or a licensed practical nurse. In some cases, it could be a, a staff nurse. In some cases, it could be a nurse practitioner. In some cases, it could be the, um, a genetic counselor. In some cases, a physical therapist may act as a clinic coordinator. So um, each institution is going to have people with different um, skills, skill sets, and capacity to do any given role. So again, your clinic may not look like the next one, or if you move, the clinic you move to may not look exactly the same as the one you attend now. Um, turnover, illness, responsibilities that other clinic, that clinic personnel have um, can temporarily change your experience. We have our, uh, our nutritionist is out on maternity leave. So um, while we have a substitute nutritionist, she doesn't have the same level of expertise in neuromuscular um, patients that our usual one does. Similarly, um, unfortunately, people do not stay in the jo same job their whole lives. So um, when we have turnover, there's often a learning curve while we bring another specialist sort of up to speed on this particular specialized patient population. So sometimes you have to be a little bit um, patient as we deal with the demands of um, just living in the real world which we're all um, really quite uh, used to at this point, I think. Um, 
Another thing that has changed that I've certainly seen over the many years that I've been doing this is that clinical care changes, and so the makeup of what is needed in the neuromuscular team might change. Um, the expensive new treatments that we are bringing in are fabulous, but they also mean that we need different levels of both pharmacy and administrative support, for example, as one example there. And then finally, the, the patient level needs are certainly highly variable. Different diseases need different team members. And that's, um, so for example, not all muscular dystrophies involve the heart. I've talked about having the cardiologist sit there, um, but some muscular dystrophies don't affect the heart. They don't need a cardiologist. And certainly when we talk about all the different kinds of, of um, diseases that can be um, seen in one MDA clinic, you have to tailor the team members for the individual disease. Um, there are obviously different needs at different stages of the disease. The four-year-old with Duchenne doesn't have the same needs as a 14-year-old with Duchenne. Um, and then the the, if you have a primarily adult neuromuscular clinic, those needs are not necessarily the same as a pediatric clinic. Both rehab may be more important in the adult clinic, whereas um, managing the school requirements are more important in the pediatric clinic. There are a lot of different models for um, multidisciplinary care. Um, the goal, again, of, of all of them is to minimize the burden on patients and families while optimizing care. Um, I, these are models off the top of my head. I'm sure that there are others that, um, that I didn't summarize here, but and this is sort of like, how does the day work? That's what I mean by model. So, one is that the patient comes to the clinic, they're put in one room, and then various clinic members go in and out, and they're relieved maybe to go to the bathroom, but basically they stay in one room, and we move in and out. In some settings, that doesn't, that's not possible, and the patient needs to travel from space to space in a single day, ideally within a building or nearby buildings. Um, there are some situations where the um, a provider is not available on the day as the MDA clinic, and so appointments may be facilitated or help to be coordinated by the clinic coordinator, but they occur on different dates or maybe in a different building, a different um, facility altogether. Um, some families prefer to get some of their care locally, and that then can be coordinated with the primary neuromuscular clinic. So for um, there are sometimes that that families, there are a lot of reasons that they may want to get some of their care locally. And then I think probably the most common is a hybrid of any or all of the above. Um, so we, where we try to personalize the delivery of multidisciplinary care within the limits of what is available for the institution and clinic and what the family needs, where they live, how this is going to work out best for them. Um, I think most of us prefer to have a lot of the care done at one institution so that we have ready access to all the medical records so that we can talk to our colleagues. Um, about um, specific aspects of care. It's a little bit harder when you don't know the, pa patient, the um, person delivering the care if it's done locally, um, but that is not always possible. Whoops, back we go. So um, another aspect of multidisciplinary care is the balance of optimizing care with the um, potential for exhaustion or information overload. So the information overload, um, I'm, I always worry about that when particularly very early in the disease when we are um, trying to, you know, you're having somebody who just learned a disease and they're meeting with the neurologist and the geneticist and the um, physical therapist and the social worker and they are overwhelmed with data. So trying to um, make sure that we don't 
um, give too much information. I think people quit hearing anything after about an hour. Um, on the other hand, things have become a little bit different because most patients, even coming in with a new diagnosis, have done a lot of reading online, so they actually come in with more questions. But it's still a balancing act. And then there's patient exhaustion, patient and family exhaustion. So um, just when I read through the 2018 Duchenne care guidelines, I thought, that's all wonderful, but also very intensive. So I put together um, an estimate, which I considered a fairly conservative estimate of the amount of time that each of the things that would be listed for a 14-year-old with Duchenne who took a mental health questionnaire, screened positive on that, and so needed the follow-up. And the estimated time for their clinic visit was 400 minutes. If we added in some lunch, that would be 460 if we gave them 60 minutes for lunch, which was 7.7 .7 hours, which is a really long time to um, be in clinic, to be going through testing, to be hearing, new, hearing information. Um, especially if you have to drive there and drive back. So it makes a very long day. So again, depending on the, the family, the stage of disease, we may break those up into more than one day. Um, and again, try to make sure that, that we are scheduling with the family's preferences in mind. Oops. So just as an example, I was going to talk a little bit about how we do our clinic. Um, we are always in evolution, and I will say that, um, you know, there, we are, I give this as an example because it's the one I know, not because it is ideal in every way. There are always things that I wish we could improve on. Um, just by way of introduction for anybody who is not familiar with Iowa, um, we're right there. Um, the population is about 3 million. The population of pigs is 20 million for reference. So if we were taking care of pigs, we would have a different problem. Um, it's about six hours to, to drive from border to border. So our families are driving for five to six hours to come to Iowa City, which is over about there. Um, our clinic sees all ages, so the way we um, do transitions is that we follow patients into adulthood, but we transition their cardiology, pulmonary, endocrine, and other subspecialty care. So um, um, that way, if, they, if somebody does end up needing to go into the hospital or something, um, they have adult providers who are familiar with the disease and are able to take care of them. Um, and we do include both diagnostic assessment and long-term follow-up in the clinic. I'll talk a little bit about outreach clinics too. Oops, every single time. So in our clinic, these are the people who are available to see patients on the same day and typically see almost every patient. So the nurse or genetic counselor, Christina Trout, our physical therapist, Shelly, um, our nutritionist when she's not on maternity leave, a social worker, a respiratory therapist, a genetic counselor is available, and then Christina is also um, trained in genetic counseling, and I also have um, training in genetics. So. Um, we have a genetic counselor available. She can come down to clinic. She is not necessarily sitting there to see every patient. We've added a pharmacist who is available in every clinic. Um, she, again, doesn't see every patient, patient certainly, but is very helpful with um, helping to manage and answer questions about complex um, and very expensive drugs that have become available for our patients and then myself. So those are the people who are sitting in the neuromuscular clinic, oops, every time. And then um, in the same space, we have pediatric cardiology, pulmonary, and endocrine. So in general, in our setting, the patient sits in their room and sees 
all of the people on the previous slide, they need to see um, cardiology, pulmonary, and endocrine often in the same room. Occasionally, they'll be moved to a different room in the same clinic, but often in the same room. So um, again, those can be very long days. And then orthopedics in our setting. So this is just, I bring this up because it's an example of how um, despite our efforts to make everything as seamless as possible for our patients. In our case, um, I do clinic on Tuesday. The orthopedist who specializes in scoliosis surgery operates on Tuesday, and he's um, had his Tuesday um, operating room day even longer than I've had my Tuesday clinic, and that is not going to change. So patients who need to see orthopedics or follow-up of their scoliosis, either need to um, stay overnight and see them a different day or come back on a different day. And then um, psychologists, we have both a um, healthcare, um, healthcare psychologist who can help with healthcare adjustment and, and um, stress management and then a psychologist who has a particular interest in the neuropsychological aspects of some of our um, disorders and does neuropsychological testing. Those are also not available on the same day of, as clinic um, in general. And this is one of those situations where um, working with a local provider is often helpful. If somebody does need counseling, that's usually done once a week. That can be in a state um, like Iowa, which is rural and we are not central, is really better done probably with a local provider. There are a lot of other key personnel. Um, so we have a staff nurse who doesn't sit in clinic but helps with doing phone management and all helps with prior approval and all those other things that happen outside of clinic. The schedulers are critical. We are often trying to schedule six or seven appointments coordinated in the same day. They are a huge uh, help. We have an administrative assistant whose primary goal is to help manage our complex drug programs. And then we have the research team shown here with COVID, uh, um, COVID protection and, isol and uh, um, social distancing. Um, who are available to talk to the family in clinic or available after um, clinic by phone. So I mentioned outreach clinics. Um, because we are a rural state, this is where Iowa City is. Um, we offer outreach clinics where we drive to these places that have stars. So from one to two hours away, to try to minimize the burden on families um, wanting our care. Now, outreach clinics, we can't take everybody. So this is who goes with us to outreach clinics. So we have a neuromuscular physician, a, a nurse coordinator, a physical therapist, and often a student and or resident. Um, these are very busy days. Um, so I will typically leave at six and get home around eight at night on these days. Um, sometimes the outreach center will have uh, some additional ancillary help that is there, um, but often we'll work either with local people, do phone follow-up with other team members, um, or we'll help to arrange visits with local providers. Um, so it's uh, another example of the balance between trying to provide patient convenience and the one-stop shopping. Again, we don't have the full team with us when we go to outreach clinic. And finally, I wanted to just mention telehealth. Um, I think everybody knows that there's been a rapid growth in telehealth thanks to COVID-19. And for a period of time, um, we were all able to, there was, um, reciprocity between states. So we were actually able to, for example, I was able to provide telehealth to a patient in Illinois, for example. Um, that has restricted back so that now you can only provide telehealth for a patient who is physically in the state that you are, um, that you are licensed for. Um, we have done such peculiar things as having patients drive across the border and do telehealth by phone. But, um, 
It is ideal for those who have limited ability to travel or during severe weather like we've had this year. Um, there are drawbacks. Um, you know, it's you can't do an exam. It's really hard to do some of the physical therapy things that are so important. I even though um, the video we've gotten much better at video, I think that it's not the same as being able to see somebody in person. Um, there, obviously, you can't do echocardiograms and pulmonary function testing. So I don't think telehealth is going to replace um, in-person visits in neuromuscular disease, but it is helpful um, in specific situations. Um, so how exactly a multidisciplinary telehealth visit works, I think that is still an evolution. Um, I know a number of colleagues who will schedule, you know, you meet with your physician, then your physical therapist, then your um, social worker, then your clinical coordinator, or some variation on that theme. Um, um, other times you may um, meet with your physician and then do phone follow-up on a separate day or as needed with some of the other um, um, services in the clinic. And then I'm sure there are going to be many other approaches to this over time. So this is really, I think, still in evolution. So to sort of summarize this part, um, what can a patient expect from a multidisciplinary neuromuscular clinic? You can expect assistance in getting your own or your child's medical needs met despite complexity. And I wanted to emphasize again that this does not mean you will always get what you want. Um, we all do the best we can. Um, but it's, it's sometimes just not possible to get the appointment at the time you want when you want it. Um, you should have a contact person who can help you work the system. When I um, have family members who are ill, I am blown away that anybody is able to work in our healthcare system without having a medical professional in the family. So for anybody who doesn't have a medical professional in the family, you should have somebody, a name and an email and a phone number or you know, uh, my chart, a way to get in touch with somebody who can help you work your way through the system when you have a chronic disease. Um, you should have a healthcare team who is familiar with the needs of neuromuscular diseases. And again, every cardiologist is not going to know the details of your particular rare form of muscular dystrophy. Um, the, the specialists may or may not know the details of your disease, but they should be familiar with the needs of people with neuromuscular disease. They should, the cardiologist should not be asking the person in the wheelchair to do a six minute walk test. Um, they should recognize that although that may be helpful in some of their patients, it doesn't apply to this one. Um, and then you should get assistance with navigating and find, finding the resources that are available to help defray the costs and the additional stresses of living with neuromuscular disease. So, um, and here I'm basically talking about a social worker or somebody who can fill that role. Um, there are a lot of services out there. There's a lot of paperwork that you have to fill out. I am totally ignorant of it, and I am deeply grateful that I have social workers and nurses who understand that. Um, I don't see how families do it. So you should be able to have somebody who can help you. And then you should have confidence that your team is knowledgeable and is doing their best to help you. So um, this is a picture that Christina Trout put together of our neuromuscular team congratulating our COVID era graduates wearing our face shields. We are socially distanced outside at the time, so we don't have on masks, but um, we work with a great team. So um, very briefly here, um, just a couple of things that um, come up in clinic with, uh, with regard to COVID-19 and our neuromuscular patients. In general, my neuromuscular patients are used to social, social distancing, distancing. They have been doing this for flu season every year for a very long time. Reminders from the CDC about how you minimize your risk. The pediatric age group um, is in a relatively lower risk. Now, 
Um, so this is from the CDC website yesterday, I think, um, and shows that the, the um, number of cases of COVID-19, this is just cases that have tested positive, is really quite a bit lower in the zero to 18 age group than it is in the other age groups. And then most importantly is the risk of severe COVID-19 is lower in children than it is in adults. So although people with neuromuscular disease may have respiratory or cardiac um, complications, the probability that a child is going to get severe COVID-19 is way lower, and it's this bracket, way, way, way lower than older people. So we are fortunate that um, the pediatric patients are at lower risk for severe disease. Anecdotally, the patients that I have had, even who have been quite weak, um, who have tested positive for COVID-19 have done quite well. They have not, knock on wood, um, ended up in the hospital. And my colleagues around the country largely support similar experience. So I think that while this is always, this has been an incredibly stressful time for um, parents of children with neuromuscular disease, um, there is good news. Um, but it clearly doesn't mean we can relax. And maybe part of the reason that they have done well is that um, these families have been very proactive and very careful. Um, I had one family point out to me that the power wheelchair acts sort of as a six foot um, barrier and social distancing um, approach. Um, so COVID-19 and vaccination, I think everybody knows this, but the Pfizer drug is approved for those 16 and over. The Moderna drug is approved for those 18 and over. Um, clinical trials are in progress and I just, um, highlight here when we might hear, near, hear something, and this is from the New York Times, sources of all medical information. Um, so the Pfizer is hoping to get results out first quarter of this year. I have not heard that anything from them yet, but this will be for children ages 12 to 15. And then following this trial, they'll lower it down to younger children. So uh, assuming that it's safe and effective. So um, stay tuned, first quarter, we should be hearing something by the end of March. Moderna is still recruiting for similar ages, although a little bit higher, um, and data is, a point, is expected sometime this summer. So um, trials are in progress in children, and I think that um, hopefully by this time next year, we will be vaccinating children. Caretakers of children with significant health care needs can get vaccinated, and so parent, that includes parents. So if your child does is in a high-risk category, um, I, you have to look at your local requirements, but in many states, parents are able to get vaccinated. COVID-19 in school, a balancing act. Children need to be with their peers. They need that normal development. They need to learn social skills, mental health. We are reading a lot about teenagers and how um, devastating this has been for mental health. On the other hand, some of my children say this is great because um, I prefer to be at home. So you have to think about what's best for your child. Another issue is that most children make better academic, and pro better academic progress in person. On the other hand, the risk of getting COVID-19 is higher if you attend school than if you're living in a COVID bubble. So everybody has to think, what are the rules in your school? Is our masks mandated or is it free for all? Is they, do they attempt social distancing? Do they do any tracking of disease? What's the level of virus in your community? And then how's your kid doing? How are they doing in school? How are they doing emotionally? So take home points, follow the CDC guidelines, balance your child's mental and academic health with the risks in the community. And most importantly, if you're offered a vaccine, say yes. Um, Sometimes people are offered one and say no because my Aunt Tilly probably needs it more than I do. Your Aunt Tilly's not going to get it if you say no. So 
if you're offered, say yes. So with that, I will thank you for your attention. Thank you to the team, the core neuromuscular team that I work with who are wonderful, are my various funding agencies. And I think we have time for some questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. We did get a couple questions that have come in. Um, what is the role of the endocrinologist? That's someone that um, this family has not seen. Okay, so the endocrinologist often, at least in my practice, comes in relatively later in disease course. They manage um, um, osteoporosis treatments. So if a, all, all neuromuscular patients who have significant weakness have increased risk of osteoporosis, and then for children who are on things like steroids, that risk goes up. So that's one major role of the um, endocrinologist. Another thing that um, they will address is for older boys who are on chronic steroids, they can have um, significantly delayed um, puberty and may benefit from testosterone um, supplementation. So that is another thing that the endocrinologist will address. Okay. Those are probably the two main uh, roles, osteoporosis management and puberty. Okay. And another person has asked, how often does a patient need to attend a clinic? <laughs> Loaded question. Yeah, there is an interesting question. So um, <laughs> I think some of it depends a little bit on on the, it depends on the disease, it depends on the disease state, it depends on um, the individual person. So there are some diseases that are extremely slowly progressive and early on have very minimal needs. And I may check in with those patients once a year, occasionally once, even once every two years or 18 months. Many patients have diseases that questions come up, issues come up, things are changing, and we see, so every six months is a very common time, uh, time frame, um, but there are times, uh, particularly maybe early in after diagnosis, when families just have a lot of questions, and I may see people every three months for a period of time, or if somebody's going through a period of rapid change, and we just can't do everything in one day. So there, like so many issues, there is not one size fits all. So you have to tailor it to your situation. Um, okay. And then at, when a family does see a multidisciplinary clinic, are they to assume that all doctors are having a discussion about their appointment at the end of that day? That is an ideal world. Okay. Um, I would love to tell you yes. On the other hand, um, that is not always the case. We do, okay. I think we mostly try to, if there are big issues, um, mm -hmm. we'll try to coordinate that. But no, most of us don't have the opportunity to sit down at the end of the day and talk about the patients. Some clinics, I think, do. We find it hard. Okay. Um, we have a question that has come in, and I'm not sure if you're going to know the answer to this. Do you know if any Duchenne clinics in the Midwest have Fibrogen for heart and lung available? The Fibrogen clinical trial? I believe so. Yeah, so um, I'm, I can only answer for myself. We are in the process of opening. Okay. Um, but I don't, I don't know what the other sites are. I would advise looking at either the MDA clinical trial finder tool or clinicaltrials.gov. Okay. All right. And coming up next, we are going to hear from Dr. Partha Ghosh, who's going to talk about research and clinical trials. So we will also delve into his talk as well. So thank sure. you very much, Dr. Matthews, for your presentation. Thank you.